Our scripture reading is the rest of the story from Acts chapter 2. We read how the Holy Spirit came into the room with a sound of a violent wind. I didn't read how uh, some of the people who had gathered from all the different countries in the neighborhood um, had made fun of the uh, believers, saying, well, they've had too much wine. We pick it up in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, And all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, by wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And our text is verse 33, where it says, Exalted to the right hand of God, Jesus has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear.
Dearly loved people of God, I know that not all of you follow sports, but maybe some of you have heard about this basketball team. Yeah, I don't know, something about winning a championship or something like that. I, don't know, I heard it on the news. This week, the Raptors have three opportunities to become NBA champions. I know a lot of people are kind of hoping that they do it on Monday night. It's a neat story, isn't it? I've kind of been following. I mean, you can hardly avoid it, right? But I have watched some of the last four games of the finals. Not all of it. I didn't want to stay up quite that late, but just to see a little portion of it, to experience it. Maybe it's just that fear of missing out that everybody's talking about, FOMO. I didn't want to miss all of it. I kind of want to see it. And I think there's other people doing the same thing, even if they aren't basketball fans. And you have to admit, the games are entertaining. And yet, these games, despite the entertainment value, are not going to change your life. It won't make any of us taller. It won't make any of us better. It probably won't make many of us richer either. Not unless you actually own some of those court-sized seats and are auctioning them off for, well, for lots of money. But it's an experience, isn't it? It's a shared experience that a lot of people in southern Ontario, a lot of people across Canada are, are going through the same ups and the same downs and experiencing this all together. Whether or not you're there in Jurassic Park, in Toronto or more locally. The idea of watching this and following this is that you'll be able to say one day, I remember that. I remember when, well, whatever the Raptors do this week, you'll remember it. And I don't want to be a wet blanket, but this isn't going to have a lasting effect, at least not on most of us. Next year, there's going to be another team that makes it to the NBA Finals. There's going to be another story. There's going to be another NBA champion. And in 2001, there's going to be another one. And in 2002, if it all continues, it's all going to keep on going. In a couple of years, all of this will just be a memory and just history. And yet history is significant, isn't it? This past week, there was an anniversary that got celebrated. January the 6th was the 75th anniversary of D-Day. The beginning of the end of World War II. Huge sacrifices were made for people to get on the beaches and to start lifting the oppression of the Nazis all over Europe. Do you think D-Day had an effect on your life? Do you think D-Day affected your freedom? Did it affect the choices that your grandparents made, that your parents made? Did it affect choices that you have made? Maybe that was more significant in some of our stories than the NBA Finals. These were some of the things that were going through my mind as I was preparing for this message. Because on the news you heard about the NBA Championship, on the news you heard about D-Day, and there I was sitting in my study trying to work on a sermon that talked about another historical event. A historical event that we know as Pentecost. Can I have that slide? I think it's a cool one. Is it there? Oh, there it is. Yeah, there's, there's my uh, D-Day slide. And there's my Pentecost one. Fifty days after Easter, Christians remember and celebrate how God the Holy Spirit came on the church in power. And this was a historical first. Not that the Holy Spirit hadn't come on people in power. That happened all through the Old Testament. It happened all through Jesus' ministry. But never had the Holy Spirit come so powerfully on so many people. Huge crowds saw the tongues of fire as they stood on top of the disciples' heads. 
They heard that sound of the rushing wind as it came through the place where everyone was staying. It's one of the things that helped draw the the crowd. They heard the noise. They saw the tongues of fire. And when they gathered, they heard all these people, all these Galileans, explaining what Jesus had done and said and the miracle of his resurrection, explaining it in languages that they could hear, their own home tongue. We could ask the same question about Pentecost that we asked about the NBA Finals, that we asked about D-Day. Do the events of Pentecost have an effect on your life? Have the events of of Pentecost affected choices that your ancestors made? Have the events of Pentecost, the coming of God the Holy Spirit in power, has that had an effect in your life? If God the Holy Spirit has come on the church in power, well, what have you seen? What have you heard as a result of the Holy Spirit coming and moving in you? The Holy Spirit coming and moving among us. The Holy Spirit guiding and leading the church. I'm not just talking about visions and miracles. Those are important And in recent sermons, we've talked about visions, Peter's visions, Cornelius' vision from the book of Acts. And we're going to be talking even more in the next couple of weeks about John's vision in the book of Revelation, how he experienced and saw Jesus glorified and brought messages from Jesus that he received in the vision, how he brought those messages to the seven churches. We're going to look at those in depth over the next couple of weeks. Seven, I think. The Holy Spirit has come to transform lives. Holy Spirit has come to transform attitudes so that the gospel of Jesus Christ takes root and has effect in people's lives. I mean, that whole message gets proclaimed in the power of the Holy Spirit and it has effect. It transforms people so they trust in Jesus because the Holy Spirit softens their hearts and allows them to know and to believe that not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven in Jesus Christ. It's only the Holy Spirit that can give that deep-rooted assurance that this means something for me. For us, for Tilsonburg Christian Reformed Church in 2019. The celebration of Pentecost is just one of those markers on the church calendar. The church keeps time, you know. In the Old Testament, it did that by having the feasts that everybody had to attend. The Passover was one of those. Everybody had to come and remember how God brought them out of Egypt. And the Feast of Pentecost was another one. It was an early harvest feast that as people brought in their first fruits of their barley, they also got together and celebrated God's grace and His generosity and the harvest that they, could ha- that they had. But we do that in the church as well, that we look at the calendar and we divvy time up to, to remember significant events in our salvation history as well. We remember the significant events in Jesus' life and His ministry, and we do that because His story is our story. It shapes, his, Jesus' story shapes our understanding of our place in the world, of our place in history. And so the church calendar was designed to spark our imaginations, to shape the way that we view history. And so each year it begins with Advent. Late November, early December, we start to anticipate and look forward to Jesus' coming. We we mark this as a time of looking forward to Jesus' second coming, knowing that he went away and is coming back. We also mark this as a time of counting down the days to our celebration of Jesus' coming. It's counting down the days to Christmas. Christmas is that time when we marvel that God in all His glory put that off and humbled Himself to become human, just like you and me and everybody else. It's a celebration of what we find in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Christmas is that, that time when we remember God giving his son, the son humbling himself. Because we all need a redeemer. Human disobedience, human rebellion has messed up God's creation. And it's not just something historical long time ago that Adam and Eve disobeyed. No, each of us has also disobeyed. Each of us falls short of God's expectations. We don't live up to what the Ten Commandments tell us. Holiness and righteousness and goodness looks like. I mean, judge for yourself how successful you are. Do you meet your own goals for being kind and generous? Do you meet the benchmark that you have for forgiving people, for being truthful, honest, and at the same time loving? I know I don't. The theological term for that is sin. And the consequences of sin are always death and damnation. Both physical death, but also being cut off from all of God's goodness, His love, His compassion for all eternity. But Christmas is the beginning of the story of redemption through Jesus. No, no, it starts way after, way before that. Genesis 3.15, the story starts already about how God will set things straight. But at Christmas, we remember the need for a Savior and how the Savior came. And Lent is the celebration marking time of how much it cost for us to be saved. It coincides with springtime, but it is a time of sober reflection, of thinking, of the cost of salvation to Jesus Christ. And and it culminates... It all comes to a head on Good Friday when we reflect on what Peter describes to the church, to the Christians, the crowd rather, to the crowd at Pentecost. Peter stands there in front of everybody and all the others are interpreting what he says and they explain how Jesus fulfilled God's word through the Old Testament prophet Joel where it says, Joel says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Peter unpacks that. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the mockers We get painted into this picture as well. And yet there's a remove for us as well because it happened so long ago. The people who gathered in Jerusalem that day, they knew these events. They had seen the results of Jesus' miracles. They had heard the stories and the rumors of what he had done. They heard that there was something a little bit funny about his crucifixion, about Jesus' burial. And maybe, maybe there was a good reason behind that tomb that was empty that everybody is talking about. Many of those people had been in Jerusalem for the Passover. These were both feasts that loyal Jews were supposed to show up for. And now they're back in Jerusalem. The sights and the sounds of God the Holy Spirit confirm that Jesus' crucifixion did bring salvation. And that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved through Jesus. Because he died in place of sinful people. And then comes Easter. That celebration of Jesus' resurrection. Peter continues to describe what happened that weekend. He affirms all the rumors that people have been hearing and repeating. God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. He went on, God raised Jesus, this Jesus, to life, and we are all witnesses of it. 
This is things that the Peter and all the other disciples, all of the other people gathered there that day had seen and heard and experienced. And they were able to tell the people who came from long distances that this is what we have seen and heard. We're witnesses of Jesus. We've eaten with him. We've talked with him. And we saw him return to glory because that's what happened on Ascension Day. Forty days after Easter, we celebrate Jesus' ascension. Our text speaks of Jesus being exalted to the right hand of God. This is a position of power, of authority, of honor. It's really an odd place for a human to be. Because Adam and Eve were pushed away out of God's presence. Because to be close to God when they were not pure would burn them. It would kill them. But Jesus, in His resurrection, in His ascension, comes into the throne room of God and is able to take His rightful place sitting on the throne of God at the right hand of God the Father. He's able to sit there because He is God most holy. He's able to sit there as a human because He is perfect and righteous. And He is our guarantee, our assurance, that as we have faith in Him, we also can be in God's presence. In some ways, in Jesus Christ, we, who are part of His body, are already seated with God in glory. That's what Peter explains, right? Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He is the one who has made it possible for us to be saved from sin. It affirms everything that Jesus taught, everything that Jesus said about himself. Because he is Lord and Messiah, we can hang on to his promises that by faith we do and will reign with Jesus. His death on the cross has made it possible for ordinary people like you and me and everybody else to enter into God's glory, to feel comfortable in His presence despite all of His holiness and majesty. Because our guilt, our shame has been taken away in Jesus Christ. We're crowned in glory as God's dearly loved children. And already now we reign with Christ as we care for children as we plant gardens and fields, as we wash the dishes or pick up toys, we are exercising our authority, ruling under Jesus Christ. We're doing exactly what we were created and redeemed to do. And then the final celebration is Pentecost. It's the day that Jesus received from God the Father the promised Holy Spirit. And he has poured out what all the crowds there now saw and heard. This is the day when Jesus' disciples received a double, double portion of Jesus' spirit. And it's a reference back to the Old Testament prophet Elijah and Elisha. If you read the daily readings, you might remember the story how when the time came for Elijah to be done his ministry, to be done his word, work as God's spokesman among the people of Israel, that he went across the Jordan. And Elisha refused to be left behind. He stuck with Elijah, even though he knew that Elijah was going to be taken away. And he asked Elijah, he said, please give me a double portion of your spirit. The oldest son's best portion is what he wanted. And when that fiery chariot came down and swooped in to pick Elijah up and take him up into heaven, then his mantle fell to the earth. And Elisha picked it up and put it on. And it was symbolic that he was standing there in the spirit of Elijah. And he was able to continue Elijah's work, proclaiming God's word acting as a prophet, just the way Elijah had done. And now the disciples, 
who had seen Jesus ascend into glory, who kept watching in the sky until finally that cloud swept in and hid him from their sight, they also received the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, in double portion, way beyond anything they'd ever seen or heard or received before, so that they could continue that work of proclaiming God's word, proclaiming the message of salvation, proclaiming the glory and the forgiveness and the grace of God as displayed in Jesus Christ. God, the Holy Spirit, has come on the church, has come on us, so that we also can tell the stories of what we have seen and what we've heard of God's grace, His mercy, His compassion. And so it's a significant celebration in the history of the church. It's a significant celebration in the calendar of the church. We celebrate a historical event. We marvel to see the Holy Spirit's intervention in our world at this moment and throughout all of history. I mean, these are big events of renewal. A lot of what the Holy Spirit does is on a small scale, though. One person's heart, mind, perspective changed at a time. And as those stories get changed, sometimes it's something that snowballs. There's times and places in the history of the church when many people experience that work of the Holy Spirit. It almost seems contagious that as one tells the story, something else happens in somebody else's life. That people see and hear what the Holy Spirit is doing for others and they eagerly beg the Holy Spirit to do something similar in their life, in their experience. And so I want to ask you the same question about Pentecost that I did about about the NBA Finals and about D-Day. Does this make a difference in your life? Has it changed the experience of your ancestors? Has it changed stuff in the course of your life that God the Holy Spirit has come in power? Two weeks ago in the evening, we heard a sermon by Louis Giglio on Psalm 23. And it did something really unique among the people that were gathered here preaching on that passage and unpacking it the way he did made this a safe place for people to share share their own stories. I'm not going to tell you those. They're not my stories. They belong to the people that told them. But it was a safe place for people to say, there on the toughest day of my life, I also found myself paging through Scripture and found in the Psalms a word of comfort, a word of assurance, a challenging word, but something that I could hang on to. They shared the stories of how sometimes on the toughest day of their life, God, by His Word and by His Spirit, assured them of His closeness, assured them of His love, assured them that He would not let them go, but that He's carved them on the palm of His hand, that they are seated in the palm of his hand might feel dangerous, but it's a safe, safe place to be. That God feasts his people even in the presence of their enemies. That's the stories we have. We told that night. You could tell other stories from your own experiences, I'm sure. And if you don't have your own story, to ask somebody else and pray that God the Holy Spirit will come and transform, and reassure, and convince you that in Jesus' death and resurrection, you've become God's dearly, dearly loved child. And He'll never, ever leave you alone. For you have become the dwelling place of God Most High. You have become a temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives within you. I will never leave you alone.